We're recording. We're recording. What's up? Did we put this for yesterday or today? Today. Yep, this is today. So today is actually 9 1, September 1st. All right. We didn't have one yesterday. So we'll have one yesterday. Don't worry about it. Bless you. What is this? Your second buyer for the week? Third? Anybody here? Oh, I just called already. Put the date by. All right. Hey, quiet, 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 quiet. We're done with So, describe the basic structure of a manor. Within your response, detail the importance of a castle, how castles improved from early to higher Middle Ages, and basic parts of the castle. So the documentary really pinpointed about a lot of those positions within the castle, the defenses. Maybe you can talk about the dungeon. Maybe you can talk about the living space of the Lord. Right? Maybe talk about uh, the peasants, where they're at, where their farmlands are, what's a uh, heavy influence within the peasant's life. Talk about entertainment. Right? So the documentary hit on that as well. I talked a little bit about jousting yesterday, right? And uh, maybe I'll show you a video maybe next. Well, maybe tomorrow. How about tomorrow I talk about entertainment during the Middle Ages? We can do that. That'll be fun. Bless you. Bless you.
All right, before we get started here, anybody going to watch the football game today? Penn State plays. Why are you going to watch it? You big Penn State fan? All right, so you can even back up even more now. That's fine. You're less of a sir. All right, so yeah, I'm excited for the college game today. Pitt plays today in Pittsburgh. That's cool. They play West Virginia. The backyard brawl. That's what they call it. They call it. All right, here we go, here we go. So, what? I don't know. If it is, it's a preseason game. All right, so let's get started here. Let's get started. The Middle Ages, we talked about why there was a need for banners, right? Why there was a need for feudalism. Why? Why? And during the high Middle Ages, many people were moving to these banners, which are now known as cities. Paul, go ahead. Like to protect the uh, yeah, good job. So, for protection, right? For protection against the barbarians, uh, against these vandals, right? You guys ever hear of vandalism? Yeah, the term vandalism? Well, that's where it comes from, actually. So, when the Roman Empire was falling, when it was coming to an end, vandals came and destroyed a lot of their buildings, a lot of their infrastructure. So, they called it vandalism. Get it? Matt? Okay. And then also, they have these Muslim groups coming from. Northern Africa, moving into what we know as modern-day Spain. So with that, the fall of the Roman Empire, it brought on feudalism. Okay? It brought on this change. All right, so with castles, what do we have about castles? Why well, was it important for castles being built? How would they build? How would they construct? Think about the fortifications. Why were they so important? Why? Go ahead. Uh, so they were important because it kept everyone safe no matter where they were in the castle. Okay. Because it was most likely, like the defense was even on every side. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Except maybe right where the uh, draw gate is, right? Yeah. Where the gate entrance is. Okay, good. But there are a lot of defenses in that gate entrance, right? Mm -hmm. The arrows. Yeah, the, the arrow slits. slits, right? They call them the windows. You said like the trap door. The, the trap door, yeah. So they're dropping boulders and huge rocks from obviously above, and they're walking in that entrance, just tossing it down on these invading forces. Chris? Why, if you spoke without my permission, what's the punishment for that? Oh, geez. Six push ups. Okay. All right, we'll get to it later. Good. I like it. Okay, so yeah, we have these fortifications, we have the watchtowers. <laughs> what else is out in front of this castle here to try to prevent anybody from just scaling the wall and jumping up over top? Well, the moat. A moat. Okay, good. Sometimes, you know, there's water surrounding the castle. It really just depends where you build your castle. Right? So obviously you want to have it surrounding some sort of water because you need water sources, right? You need to have some sort of water for the people living in your man. And at the same time, it provides a great defense. But let's say you decide to build on top of the mountain, okay, on the very top. And obviously, it's going to be tough for any type of forces to invade. You've got to climb literally a mountain to get to you. And then chances are you'll have these high walls, high fortifications to prevent any type of invader from scaling the wall and getting over top. How did they build the wall towards the top? Did they build it more on a slant? Or did they build it straight up and down? Oh. On the, like it, was, it started to get it, it, it started to slope a little bit, right? Why would they slope it? Just to uh, then it, I don't know. Like it'd be, it'd be fall off easier. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit more, you know, it's tougher to try to climb it. Why else, Chris? Well, well, I, I, I wouldn't mention it to make it. I would just kind of motion it back to the oh, okay. so All right, Caroline, go ahead. Um, it's so they can push boulders off it. Awesome. It stuff below it. Yeah. yeah, any type of materials, right? They have large rocks, boulders that they would just toss off the top and just crush anybody that's trying to climb up over the walls. Good, good. All right, good. And then with the gatehouse, we talked a little bit about that, why I talked about the windows within the gatehouse. As soon as you maybe enter, they might have a drop door that comes through, maybe smashing anybody that gets in. And at the same time, they have these windows, these archer slits, they call them, within the castle to try to take out any of these invading forces. Right, so really, it was almost impossible. And let's say you did finally break into the castle. Are you going to survive most likely? No, no. There is just defenses everywhere. And no matter where you look, you're surrounded by any type of archers, knights, obviously, that are coming down to face you head on. Right? It was almost impossible to try to 
take over. Also, why do they build it so tall? Why are they try to build it so tall and wide and strong and fortified? Why else? Is, is there more of a psychological effect to some of these things here? Why? Intimidation, right? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Chris. All right, go ahead, Why You can say it. I'm, I'm like the Pope here, so I'm going to open power. No? Don't want to say it? Okay, Paul, go ahead. I'm going to take longer to climb up then. Needs more time for yeah, yeah, good job, good job, right? Also, because the intimidation factor, right? You see something that large, that grand, that big, and uh, you're realizing as you're trying to invade that castle, there's no chance, right? There's no chance you're going to scale that wall. There's no chance that you're going to climb, you know, up and over these moats, up and over these different types of fortifications, and even break through. Even though if you break through, chances are you're dead, right? So that might even push away some of these invading forces right from the get-go, right from the beginning. There's no way we're going to actually take this castle. All right, what about the inside of the castle here? What's the detail about that? Anybody talk about the inside of it, the floor plans? Maybe someone talks about it, talk about the dungeon. What do we got? What do we got? Anybody? Paul, you're all over the place. Let's go. You got like different trees in there. Yeah, good job. Good job. So you have the wall surrounding even the castle, right? So the castle will be inside these fortifications, and you'll have your blacksmiths, right? You'll have uh, your forms of uh, you know, the trades and goods when it comes to the farmers providing food, the food supply to the rest of the manor. All right, good. Um, you'll also have entertainment. So yesterday, the documentary talked a little bit about entertainment. I didn't talk too much about it, but maybe tomorrow I will. Uh, when it comes to jousting, when it comes to these small arenas where people will pack in and watch uh, these conquests, these fights going on right in front of your eyes. So that's their form of entertainment. A lot of times it just led to death, right? A lot of times it led to death. Caroline? I mean, for some people, the entertainment was really lost. Well. You talked about like the torture, iron wheel, tying up. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're talking so. about the torture devices, right? Yeah, good. So with these prisoners in these dungeons to try to get a little bit more of a word what's going on to try to pick up on some intelligence. Yeah, there is some uh, uses of these torture devices. I don't think anybody would want to sit on that huge triangle, would they? No, I don't think so. No one they call it a stretcher. Yeah. 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 And then, like, oh, the oh, like, oh, casket oh, with oh, all the sharp objects. Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Yep. Yeah. Paul? Um, oh, they had a well. A well, yep. Yeah. So they need water, right? They need drinking water. Yeah. What about the bathrooms? What about the bathrooms? Where would that go? Where would that go? How do they build their bathrooms? Lana, go ahead. Yeah, pretty much, right? So if you were surrounded by, let's say, a river or a creek, okay, usually the Lord would be at the very top of the castle, right? So his bathroom would literally, you know, once he goes to the bathroom, there's a tunnel that goes right out the side of the wall, and then it's just flying down into the river or in the creek, or if you didn't have that luxury, off the cliff. But yeah, where do you think these people bathe? In the river, in the creek that's surrounding the castle. So there you are, washing yourself, and there's... Crap flying down at you. Well, that's what actually happened. All right. Uh, anything else we can add? What about the peasants? So the other day I showed you a diagram of the manor. Where would the peasants reside? Where would their land be? Yeah, surrounding the manor. So initially, do you think they got any protection? No. No, they didn't. Right? So if there was an invading force, yeah, they would try to stop it before it got to the castle. Or if they're lucky, they allow them to get into the castle to maybe find a position like an arch or whatever it might be to try to prevent this attack and force from getting in. Uh, their farm fields are located outside of the manor okay, to grow food for the man. And then also, what is a high priority for these peasants? What's a high priority? What was focused out there? B, go ahead. The church. Yep, good job. And who has their own house along with, let's say, the Lord? Right? Uh, go ahead. Wyatt, go ahead. Yeah, the priest. Good job, the priest. Good, good. So again, church religion being a high priority in the lives of these people of the Middle Ages. All right, is there any questions on the castles? All right, what brought an end to the castles? The documentary hinted at this towards, you know, obviously, the end of it. Go ahead, Connor. Gunpowder. Gunpowder, right? Cannons. So if you're sitting at the very top of a castle, the highest floor, let's say, you're 100, 200 feet up in the air, 
and you see these cannons balls flying at you. Do you want to be at the top? No, because once it hits that tower, once it hits that large wall, chances are it's going to come coming down. So fortifications changed, okay? Palaces changed. And the rule of absolute monarchies changed as well. So no longer will you see these lords having these different sections all throughout the kingdom. Yeah, they might have a body of people, let's say a group of people that are helping advise the king, but these lords kind of dwindle away with the advancements of weapons. So like cannons, gunpowder, you know, obviously, muskets eventually, and that will change. Chris? They also just kind of fell out of style with how soldier standards were. Yeah. Yeah, good job. Good job. So as absolute monarchy was becoming a little bit stronger, as maybe the decline of the, you know, Catholic Church, they decided to maybe step away from castle building. Let's face it, castle buildings, it costs a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money to build these castles. It takes a lot of resources and time to do so. All right, okay, here are your terms for today. We got the Franks. Oh, sorry, I didn't put it up here yet. Frozen. Help is there. there you go. We got the Franks, Clovis, Charles the Hammer Martel. What a name. What a name. Pepin the Short and Charlemagne. You're getting used to that sharper, man. Batista. All right, so if you're not here, or maybe if I don't get a chance, usually I show videos to kind of bring things in perspective then towards the end of class or the start of the next class. But if I don't get to it for some reason, you can find those attached videos on Canvas. All right, so they're just like supplemental resources really to help you out with that. Okay, so if I don't get to a video one day and I have a plan, well, you'll see it attached to the video lesson and you can watch it. I think it's important that you do that, actually. Hey, what did I say about thought? All right, hey, get back to the terms. Get back to the terms. We'll talk later. We'll talk later.
Wait a couple more minutes. Yeah, okay, all right. Is there? Oh, well, thank you. You were right, sir. All right, okay. Does anybody need more time or are we good? Okay, all right, I'll give you another minute. I'm gonna jump right to the notes since we're running somewhat short on time. I wanna make sure I get through the lesson here and through the PowerPoint. Uh, usually I talk about these terms before we dive in, but since we're gonna be talking about many hit and now, we will just jump right to the PowerPoint. No problem. <clears throat> I'm guessing you're picking Penn State, right? Tonight against Purdue. Either Purdue or Penn State. All right, so let's get a move on here. So the Franks, what do we know about the Franks? What do we know? Carter, go ahead. Uh, All right, good, good, good. So with the Frank kingdom, we're going to talk about a few rulers here that you already looked up. And uh, it's really going to detail about how his kingdom was formed, how was she, and how the Pope <laughs> actually claims the new Holy Roman Empire. Who was that Holy Roman Emperor? Does anybody know how the names up here that was granted that title? That title. Honestly, go ahead. Charlemagne, you have a good job. Or if you want to put Charles the First there, that's fine too. That's fine too. Charlemagne is the name. Good. And we'll mention here how his kingdom just grows under each one of these yeah, these leaderships here. And I think it's important that we talk about these kings because, well, they shape what we know as the early Middle Ages. Okay. 
and how things will be directed when it comes to sophistication, when it comes to artwork, when it comes to utilizing religion in the name of the kingdom. All right, so I'll show you a few examples then of how uh, they kind of branch away from this Anglo-Saxon era, this architecture, this design, and shift more to a Gothic design when it comes to their churches, their buildings, and uh, it's, uh, it's unique. I think you guys will enjoy it. All right, so the Franks, they call a Roman province of Gaul, and uh, there was a hundred different kingdoms that were created all throughout Western Europe at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. So, again, feudalism takes hold, right? All these people need protection. They need help from these other barbarian groups, these Germanic tribes. Okay, we talked about the Vandals a little bit, right? And all, obviously these Muslim groups coming from the south. So feudalism takes hold. We see the creation of different types of kingdoms, castles, you name. Right. So with the Franks, they aligned directly with the Catholic Church. Okay. And like I mentioned, there is many, many different kingdoms. Right. So within these kingdoms, you think everybody agreed with one another? You think everybody was all on the same page? Yes, no, maybe. So Austin, what do you think? No, not at all. So when it comes down to it, you think if everybody's just off on their own, if everybody is just trying to focus on themselves rather than cooperating with the other kingdoms, you think they can protect themselves? No, no, they can't, right? So with that, they need to try to form some sort of unity. In order to try to survive, well, they need to have these kingdoms all in line with one another. They need to all fall into place to a point where there's cooperation, where there's ties, and uh, obviously, this unity would bring a sense of protection to the Frank kingdom, right? And that's where these kings that we just talked about fall in the line. And the first one we're going to mention is Clovis the first. Right? Clovis uh, is heralded is famous for uniting the Frank kingdom, right? So all these kingdoms, all these hundreds of kingdoms that were you know really based all throughout Western Europe, specifically Germany, France, okay, modern day Belgium. Right, he's bringing them all together, and he'll be respected as his first leader, this first king of the Frank kingdom. All right, so Clovis, there's a nice little, I guess you say painting of him, right? It's a picture, but it looks pretty, uh, pretty cool. So with Clovis, he converts to Christianity after a battle. He believes that all these kingdoms should utilize this religion in order to try to unify Right? What better way to try to unify these kingdoms than utilizing religion? Right? One daring, uh, I guess to say, one way of trying to uh, push more kingdoms to accept Christianity is obviously, uh, well, to accept the kingdom's rule is to utilize religion. Right? How dare you try to challenge the church? How dare you try to challenge God? And again, utilizing religion to unite these kingdoms is a great method, a great way. And that's what Clovis did. So one thing to note about Clovis, he utilized religion, he utilized Christianity to unite these kingdoms together, right? To bring them together, right? Again, no one's going to challenge the church. No one's going to challenge religion. So why not utilize that as a unify, uh, uni uh, unifying these kingdoms together? All right, so the church supports Clovis's conquests. So when it comes to these kingdoms that might not want to try to unite with the Franks, to unite under Clovis's rule, well, he has the power of the church behind him. He has God's blessing, right? So any of these kingdoms that already agreed to Christianity and agreed to Clovis's rule, well, they're going to follow him into battle. They're going to follow him in conquering and trying to take over these kingdoms that might be a little belligerent, that might not accept Clovis's rule. So he's using the church. He's using, using this established religion to help unify these smaller Frank kingdoms. All right, by 511 AD, he united the Franks into one kingdom. All right, so this would be like northern France, okay? So northern France. So again, he's very famous for, uh, again, uniting this kingdom together, okay, this strong kingdom, and he's respected by the Catholic Church. He's the first king to really do this. So the two forces were now allied together. So number one, the military with the Franks, and number two, the church. So that's one thing to note about him is that he utilized the church to unite these forces, unite these kingdoms together. 
And if these kingdoms are all aligned together, then they can protect themselves from any outside forces. Right? So he's really the first king to do that. He's the first king to do that. So make sure you guys note that. You need a military to protect yourselves, and a great way to try to unite these forces is utilizing religion, utilizing the church for your behalf. And he's known as this first start of uniting the Frank kingdom. All right, you guys good with that? Okay. All right, Charles Martel. So Charles Martel, one thing to if you want to put this in your notes, put the hammer right beside it. Okay, he gains this name by unifying even more lands under the Frank kingdom, right? And he gets the name by defeating the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. So the Muslim groups, I'll show you the map up here, were approaching from northern Africa into the bottom of Spain. So these Muslim groups were following right over here, the Siberian Peninsula. That's what that means here, Iberia Peninsula, that kind of land that almost bridges, that almost touches the bottom. And they're flowing through Spain. Right? Obviously, if they're coming into Spain, mainland Europe, that might be a threat to the French king, right? The France. So for Charles Martel, he becomes famous by continuing that line of close to first. He decides to try to expand the Frank kingdom and looks out, right? And he gains the respect, the uh, really the uh, ideals of the Catholic Church by stopping his Muslim advance into Spain. It's the Islamic groups that were marching in to try to take over and conquer these lands. So again, that's in competing religion. So if he can stop that competing religion from expanding, he's going to have the blessing of the church really forever. And that's exactly what he does. He stops the march of this group, these Muslim groups into Spain, and he, he, he gains the name the Hammer. Okay, the Hammer. So that's a quick story about Charles Martel and how he became famous. So again, he's advancing in the south, east, and north, expanding the kingdom, and he also stopped the Muslim advancement into Spain and into Europe. So he gains the name the Hammer, Charles Martel. Okay, I just talked about this, and he becomes a Christian hero. Okay, he becomes a Christian hero. So, again, he's looking at Clovis's kingdom, and he's looking to expand it. He's looking to stop any competing religions from expanding into the Holy Roman Empire's land of Europe. Okay, so he is expanding France, stopping another opposing uh, religious force, and he gains that nickname, the Hammer. Last person, well, sorry, I want to talk about two more people real quick because we're running low on time. Pepin the Short, he's the son of Charles Martel, and uh, he's really famous for continuing this, uh, this push of the Frank kingdom, right, to a point where the Frank kingdom is becoming one unified body. And that's exactly what the Holy Roman Empire wants. If they can have one Uni unified body, there's going to be less challenge. There's going to be less kings or groups that are trying to challenge that church. So if they can have uniformity in Western Europe, overall that will be a benefit for the religion. That will help the religion survive on. So the Pope declares him king by the grace of God. So pretty much all of Western Europe now is the Frank kingdom. Right. The Frank kingdom becomes so dominant in the early Middle Ages that it claims so much land that it's in what we know as modern-day Germany, Belgium, and France. Right. This will expand under Charles I, having son here, France. And as you can see here, he expands pretty far into Germany. So Pepin the Short, he's expanding even more the empire and trying to push out any type of rival opposition when it comes to Muslim religion, when it comes to any other forces, protecting against barbarians, Vikings, Vandals, you name it. All right, so main thing to note about this, guys, is protection, right? The Holy Roman Empire, they feel protected under these two rulers, okay, under the Frank kingdom. So that's why it's so important. That's why we're talking about it. Last person we're going to talk about here is uh, Charlemagne. Well, let's get here. Sorry. So Charlemagne, he becomes the next king after Pepin the Short. Well, it's his grandson, really. 
but this is the land that is conquered by Charlemagne. All right, when we talk about Napoleon, I'm sure you guys heard of Napoleon before. He looks at Char Charlemagne's empire, and uh, he really sees himself as one of these rulers that is to keep up with uh, Charlemagne. He looks at what he conquered, what he took over in Europe, and he uses that uses it as pretty much as an example. Right? He sees him as a great ruler. He sees him as a great empire, uh, emperor, and uh, a very skilled military strategist. So when we talk about Napoleon, that's who he looked up to. He wants to try to take more land than Charlemagne, obviously. But in any case, he looks at Charlemagne as a hero, as a, as, as, as a king. All right, so with Charlemagne, here's a picture of him real quick. He becomes the first Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800. And that just goes to show that he's expanding the Frank kingdom. He's utilizing his power under the church. Okay, he's protecting his people. And uh, he's trying to push off any rival religion from entering Europe. Right? What do you think this is going to lead to? What wars are we going to talk about that's based off of religion? Here? Austin, go ahead. Crusades. The Crusades. Good job. The Crusades. Once the Holy Roman Empire feels protected, once the Franks establish themselves in Europe, well, this is going to push the Pope to maybe seek out these conquests against these other religions, specifically in the Middle East. Right? That's going to lead up to the Crusades. So again, this whole time, under the Franks dynasty, they see protection under Clovis, under Pepin the Short, under Charles Martel, under Charlotte. And they see expansion of that kingdom. Once that kingdom becomes protected, once it becomes a little bit stronger and expands throughout Europe, well, now they can look to attack these oppositions. Does that make sense? So the first goal is for protection, for expansion in Europe. Once they have that, then they can seek to destroy any other religion that challenges. Christianity that challenged the like Catholicism. All right, you guys got that. So make sure you guys write that down because that's very important. All right. So once we have protection, once that empire in Europe expands, the Holy Roman Empire feels safe. Well, that's going to lead to the Crusades. That's going to lead to the Holy Roman Empire. All right. See you guys. Have a good one. Take care.